So welcome to Northern Powerhouses, our business success stories series of interviews, where we discuss with local business leaders, their backgrounds, their successes and their challenges, and what's really driving them forwards. And uh, this afternoon, I'm delighted to have with us Dan Croxon John, who's founder of ADA, AWA Digital, and also the new founder of Pronto Homes. So Dan, thanks so much for spending a bit of time with us. And if you'd like to introduce yourself and your companies to the audience, what you do and how you help people, that would be wonderful. Sure. Thanks, Chris, for inviting me onto your onto your series. Um, I'll start with AWA Digital, which I founded in 2009. Um, we're an international CRO agency. And for those that don't understand the term CRO, it means conversion rate optimization. So it's getting more of your website visitors to buy, uh, typically on e-commerce websites, increase the conversion rate. Um, and we... We've been fortunate enough to acquire some big name clients like Canon, Avis, Nike, Toyota, um, Interflora, uh, Woolworths in South Africa. Um, so we operate both in, in Europe and, and in the African continent with um, some work in, in, in the Americas. Um, and last year I took the decision after 13 years to step back um, the, the business is now handed over to Johan, Johan van Tonder, who was our CEO, now is our CEO. And so what I've been doing recently is developing a new business called Pronto Homes, which is um, designed to find, um, source and um, provide properties to supported living providers. Now, Again, for those that don't know, a supported living provider is an organization or, a, or possibly a charity that helps um, vulnerable people, perhaps suffering from mental health problems or um, learning disabilities or substance addiction, to remain in the community, in their, in their own home, and to receive the support that they need um, to live independent, fulfilling lives. So what Pronto Homes does is, is work with these supported living providers to find those properties, um, refurbish them, and so that the tenants in them actually can call them a home. So that's what we do. Wonderful. Well, great, great, great thing uh, to be doing, Dan. And uh, so, so if we sort of start a little bit um, at the beginning, if, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into business and why these particular ones, that would be wonderful. Sure. So I always think that new businesses come out of problems. Um, maybe they're a problem that you, you've seen other people face and you think there must be a solution or it's your own problem. The problem I had was that I came to York to run a business. Uh, I was managing director. I wasn't, I wasn't a shareholder, but I came to run it. And to cut a very long story short, it didn't work out. Um, and I said to myself, no one's going to give me a job as an MD again. Um, and so I need to, found my own business and I'd come across Google Analytics in 2005 and um, I was really interested in the idea that you could understand who was visiting your site, where they were coming from, what they were doing and in 2005 that represented quite um, quite a requirement. Um, you, you normally had to pay £30,000 to call metrics to find that information out and Google Analytics came along and it was free. So I think it transformed the way in which we regard website data. And so having left the business in York that I came to be the managing director of, I started a Applied Web Analytics. As so Applied Web Analytics was primarily around Google Analytics training, configuration, report, um, analysis, insights, and so on. And one of our clients came to us and said, that this is all very well. Um, telling us how many visits we've had and what they're doing and where they're falling out of the checkout process. But how do we monetize that knowledge? Yeah. And I said, um, well, what we do is we can create a new version of the problem page and then test it using A-B testing um, to determine whether or not this new version is um, generating more money for you. And that's exactly what we what we did. And Paper Chase um, sadly departed from the high street was that client and that year they they grew their sales by 35 um, percent right. in, in no small part due to the work that we did with them 
Um, and so from that point onwards, we were fortunate enough to win some big clients um, into Flora, um, being one that we're still with, and Canon, again, one that we're still with. And they suffer from the problem of, like a lot of e-commerce businesses, they're spending huge amounts of money getting uh, traffic to their site, but yes. it's not converting, um, amongst other things. Uh, and so um, that's that's been the journey of AWA Digital. And what we focus on really is helping people make better decisions. Because when you think about a website, frankly, everyone's got an opinion about your website. But the people that matter, the people who pay our, our salaries or well, our client salaries are their customers. Yeah. And so testing, testing improvements um, using uh, scientific experiments, which is what we do, allow people, our clients to make better decisions. Um, because the other choice is to what we call deploy and pray, which is you, you, you think this is going to make a difference, um, and you pray that it does, but you don't know because you haven't tested it. So you, 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 you're not aware. So I think um, I've been very fortunate enough to um, run a business that's that's achieved that scale. We've, Johan and I wrote a book, which was the first how-to guide to conversion rate optimization, which is now published in five languages and we're on the second edition. And so it's helped, I know, helped a number of people who've wanted to do it for themselves, perhaps they haven't been able to afford an agency like ourselves to do it for them. But we get um, questions regularly about the, the book and um, how to do this and how to do that. It, it, it's fascinating. Obviously, we, 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 we've we known each other for a little while and, and my understanding is, is the, the nut situation that, you know, large companies can spend millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions on marketing campaigns mm. to drive people to their websites without spending a, a, a fraction of that to actually make that website easy to buy from. Um, and, and I know, the example, I, I, I picked up um, with, a, with a very large retail outlet, can't mention any names, um, and I went on their site and th I think they must have changed that day the page because I literally mm. couldn't check out. And and you just realise mm. the issue of you know, mm. that that's a very simple thing, but but that idea mm. of how do I like to buy and understanding that so it's a fascinating thing that you mm. do. I think uh, the, the the I've looked around for data to um, evidence how much is being spent on traffic acquisition and how much is being spent on optimization of, of improving the experience. And the, the, the data that I have um, from Brian Eisenberg, who's one of the forefathers of optimization, was that for every uh, pound being spent on optimization, 92 pounds is being spent on acquiring the traffic. So that just shows you the sort of imbalance there is between um, traffic acquisition and, and conversion optimization. Now, those figures may well have changed, but I, I, I suspect that the ratios are broadly similar. Yeah, and it, and it, it, it seems crazy. It's, it's yeah, it's mm. getting, you know, it's almost like advertising at people who come to your shop and keeping the door and, and locking the door. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. So, so when you were, so going back a bit further than that, when you were growing up, is this mm. the sort of thing you envisaged doing as a, as a young, as a young boy? Did you have other plans? Um, I think I wanted to be a pilot at one stage, um, but my mother said I was too clumsy to land an aircraft, so <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have worked. Um, I, I I think running a business, um, I've done a number of things which are a bit entrepreneurial. Uh, university I used to type up people's um, dissertations because I had a computer before every student has a computer and charge a pound, a pound a page. Mm -hmm. um, and then I used to teach English in Italy and I brought over, uh, over a student from Italy to, uh, to Devon where I was um, teaching English again. And I put a, put him in, in, in accommodation and I sort of arranged lessons for him. So I've, I think I've always wanted to do something for myself in, in a business setting. Brilliant. So, yeah, so, so all, always been entrepreneurial and it's uh it's yeah you, you, you these are the businesses that you created uh, uh, as, a yeah. as a result so 
again, looking back over the, this period, quite a long period of time, especially with AWA, and I know a bit, a bit more briefly with Pronto Homes, but what are some of the biggest issues you've had to overcome in business? Um, I think in business, you meet yourself. Um, if you've got a flaw or a strength, then it will come out. Um, so I, I think my flaws have sometimes been about impatience, uh, wanting to do things quickly, sometimes about wanting to make decisions perhaps too quickly. So the good thing is um, very few of those decisions are, are catastrophic, but you get a chance to look at them again and uh, and reflect on whether you would do it the same way again in the future. Um, I think some of the strengths that I have is around presentation, about building relationships, strong working relationships with people, and also setting out a vision um, for a business that that people can either buy into and or, or, or not. And if they, if they don't, that's fine. But it's a way of matching your team to where you're where you're heading. And I think m- my experience is that AWA has had a, a, and still does have a very strong vision, but we've also got supporting values around community um, involvement in the sense that we give five days of paid leave to anybody that wants to volunteer for community projects. We give 5% of our um, net profit away each year to um, groups that support some of the things I'm interested in, in which is reducing loneliness felt by older people. Um, So I think business as a general point has the opportunity to change communities and mm. help those less um, less uh, fortunate. Yes. Of course, there, there are many examples where businesses haven't done that at all. They've 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 um, they've been rapacious and they they they've exploited people. But I, I I can think of the examples. Many examples of businesses that I admire have done exactly. Yeah. Uh, the opposite they, they've helped communities and they've they've used the, um some of their proceeds um their activity to to generate um goodwill and and also present movements for change if you think about the body shop which is going back a, a long time um yeah. the, the, what anita roddick did in terms of raising the issue around um cruelty to to animals in in, in scientific experiments so yeah, I'm I'm very pleased that I had a career in uh, and still have a career in, in business. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting raising the idea of Anita Rudd. I mean, absolutely transformed the, the industry mm. in terms of you know you know any any organisation that uses. I mean, I don't. I, I think animal testing is now really down to perhaps you know important drugs, etc. There isn't any. Mm. Mm-hmm. No, and, and, and yeah, that that, that disruption, uh, what a much more modern term, but how, how she has disrupted mm-hmm. that industry going back, going back a long time. So, so what 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 would be some of the things you've learned about successful bi- running a successful business um, from from your perspective? What would be some of the biggest learnings you've had? Would you say, Dan? Uh, um, I think the importance of sales, uh, and and you've helped me with this Chris a lot over the years I think um, I came thinking about sales in a very typical middle class British way about cheesy salesmen and I realised that if I wanted the business to succeed then I had to be a really good salesman and part of that is 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 study you know studying there's lots of really good sales books out there. Yeah. Um, having processes that make sure that you use those skills that you've acquired routinely and to keep on um, developing ways in which you can ask better questions. Because I think that's the answer. Good questions uh, to a prospect. And I know it sounds cheesy and I don't know any other way of expressing it, but to help people buy better. Yeah. Because there are times when what the, I always start a sales meeting is if there's not going to be a good fit between us, then just let me know because it's it's fine. We don't have to work together. Um, so sales is one of them. The, the other thing is about finding and, and, and rewarding 
and motivating great people yeah. because um, when I started Applied Web Analytics, um, I'd get the work, but then I'd use other people to do it um, because I wasn't interested in being the world's great greatest web analyst. What I was interested in is seeing what's the level of skills that other people have around it. So, um, and that was quite attractive to work with other people. I enjoy working with other people. And I think that the third thing is is about um, having dreams and goals around the business, but also thinking about how that the business can help you achieve your own personal dreams. Um, in January this year, I went away to Mexico for six weeks to learn to kite surf. And that would not have been possible if I hadn't developed a business with this where I handed had handed it over to Johan to run the business. And so I could step back and take that amount of time off. Um, so I think those are the three three right. key things. Yeah, it, it's, you know, for, for me, all those are very, you know, so valuable. I, th- I think, you know, from a sales perspective, our, our definition of sales within Action Coach is professionally helping people to buy what they need. With the brackets for me, mm-hmm. if they don't need it, then we don't sell it to them. And, and that's... As you yeah. said, establish a need. If you don't have it, then yeah. the meeting can be over quite quickly, and that's fine. Um, yeah, sure. And, and so I think it's key. But the other one is making sure that we drive our business. Given that most owner-managed businesses are there primarily, their primary goal is to give the owners the lifestyle they choose to have. Do some other great things mm-hmm. as yours do. Um, is making mm-hmm. sure the owners understand what they want to achieve. So that we can make yeah. this deliver, and, and without that, yeah. we could be on the hamster wheel for a very long time, going in the wrong direction, and, and end up not actually getting what we want. So that that all makes yeah. sense. And this next question isn't a leading question, and I really get, really need to get some some other answers. But mm. as, as a mm. business as a business coaching organisation, um, I'm keen to know who the best coaches you've worked with historically, whether that's in business, sport, or life in general. Well, it'd have to be you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I've, as well as you, I've been fortunate enough to to meet some great coaches and work yes. work with them. And there's still things I use that I've learned from those those individuals. I think sometimes um, what a great coach does is ask great questions because most of the time you know the answer. Uh, it just needs to be um, brought out in the right way, and and then to to be held to account because it's easy to say yeah I'll do this or that, but and and sometimes it's easy to make some excuse to yourself as to why you haven't done it. If you have to stand up and put it in front of somebody as to why you haven't done it, it, it doesn't work. And I think one of the coaching principles that you talk about quite a lot, uh, and it's important because. This features on, on one of our core values around integrity is, is around uh, being above and below the line. So above the line is about taking ownership and accountability and being responsible. But below the line is, you know, using blame, excuses and denial. And I think that's always been a useful mechanism for me to not only hold others to account, but also to, to hold myself to account. Am I just coming up with an excuse here? Um, that's not doesn't drive anything forward apart from procrastination. Um, so those those sort of concepts um, have been really helpful, and I think the questions that coaches can ask you um, are extremely powerful. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Um, and and I love uh, collecting quotes or sayings that people use regularly. Are there any? So the quotes or sayings you catch yourself using on a regular regular basis to help you? Yes, I think um, resilience is really key. Uh, yeah. Because inevitably, whether you're running a business or not, I, I think you'll fe- you, you'll come across setbacks. And I think one of the um, things that I always try and do is, is to answer the question, why is this a good problem to have? Hmm. Why is this a good problem to have? Because there will be something in that setback or that uh, that situation that's that, that's that's quite difficult to to deal with. That's good, and if you can find that, um, then it makes things a, a, a bit more uh, 
um, tolerable, I think, if you can see the positives to it. I think the, the process of thinking about a situation means that inevitably you cast your own filter on it. It's good or it's bad. It's not. It's it's your thought processes that make it good or bad. So um, resilience is key. Um, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, no, it's, it's it's okay. No, I, I was just asking you um, if, if any favourite quotes or sayings, obviously. That I, I, oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I so um, why is it a good problem to have? And yeah. things like um, during COVID, uh, when, when people were very worried about health and so on, um, and you'd have a setback and said nobody died, did they? Nobody died. So even if even if you have something that's a setback, really, it's um, will you remember it in five years' time? Ninety nine percent of the things that that cause you sleepless nights, you probably won't remember five years from now. So it's about keeping perspective because the mental uh, the mental struggles are probably the biggest. Yeah. That, that I face and most business owners face. It's not arranging the sales or the marketing or dealing with the operations or the finance. It's how you deal and manage yourself so that you can can ride ride the the peaks well and manage the troughs. Yeah, absolutely bang on. And going back to something you said there, I I, I picked up a, um, a phrase from one of my coaching colleagues recently that that I really found really interesting, which was. Everything is neutral until we add meaning to it. That's and, right. Yeah, and yeah. it's just fascinating, isn't it? And you, you think, well, no, no, you know, it's only this has got to have a meaning. Well, no, only if we give it that. I think one of the most powerful books that I've read is uh, in terms of resilience, or at least to understand the process of how you deal with setbacks, is the Chimp Paradox. Yes, and the Chimp Paradox talks about. Um, that part of you which when things are not going very well sort of grabs you and does this awfulization and the world's going to end and so on and that um there's a part of the book which talks about boxing the chimp and you need a, a willing friend to do this which is you go through a process and of saying oh something bad has happened and, and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and, and the, the the job of your friend is to say keep going and, and and what else happens and eventually after about 10 or 15 minutes you run out of things that are going to result from this what looks like a small setback and then you say to yourself and it only comes from yourself is that's not going to happen but nobody can tell you that's not going to happen at the time when the chimp is in we yeah. my partner and i jane we talk about the chimp is in and it means that that very powerful set of emotions are in which deprive you of all rational thought and the only way out of it to box the chimp is to have somebody say go on keep going keep going yeah. keep telling me what else is going to happen and then it runs its course and then you it's great that feeling after you've said all the things that are going to happen, the world's going to collapse, my friends are going to hate me, I'm not going to be able to pay the mortgage, and, and so on. Um, you reach that calm point where you go, yeah, it's not going to happen. Really? Love it. Absolutely love it. And, and I guess that's an example of, of my next question, but what what, what will you say, you say the key things you've learned about yourself throughout your journey, Dan? I think there's a very British tendency to... Um, talk about the things that you've learned which are negative so i can be a bit impatient i can be a bit impulsive but um i think what i've learned is that i've got quite a lot of influencing skills and presentation skills and sales skills that are quite helpful um and i think those are useful in many settings with pronto homes for example we I'm now meeting a supported living provider. So there's a process that they're going through of selecting us to work with them and thinking about how their needs can be met by what we do. Yes. Um, so so I, I think I've always enjoyed sales. I, I didn't think I'd enjoy it as much as I have, particularly the 
the process of uncovering needs, I think, is 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 really fascinating. Um, and I've tried all kinds of things to see what happens. Um, fundamentally, people love talking about themselves. So if you can just stay out the way um, when they've decided to work with you, um, I've seen lots of salespeople just keep on talking and think, just shut up. They're going to buy. Be quiet. Um, I, I, and I, I think going back to the negative in terms of impatience and um, impulsiveness is is be very aware of what your um, your flaws are and think about the kind of people around you that you need around you who, who present a balance to that. Um, yes. So we bought a business, a jewelry business, which wasn't, which didn't work out. Long story short, um, and I think looking back on that, partly to do with the 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 scope of the decision making, who who made that decision, and perhaps it would have always been me saying, "Well, let's do it." Um, but it, it's useful to recognise your flaws and to have plans to to mitigate the effects of those. Yeah, 100%. I, I, but, but I think that, um, and our founder, Brad Tugas, puts his best in terms of the willingness to be to make mistakes was, yeah. and he told me many years ago, and it's always stuck with me, which is that he feels he's as successful as he is because he's made more mistakes than anybody else he knows, not despite mm. it. Because that's that mm. willingness. And, and, you know, when you said earlier, you know, what, why is this a good problem to have? Well, so that to some extent, impatience and impulsiveness allows you to maybe make those decisions and do it, and ex- provided mm. we accept the outcome, move on. Um, and many yeah. people procrastinate forever. Yeah, I've made some really good decisions very quickly, um, yes. but some of the, sometimes I, I've made poor decisions quite quickly as well. So. But that's and, inevitable. And that's all good. <laughs> so looking forward a little bit, what does the future look like for, for, for you and the businesses? Um, and what challenges do you face, do you think, if any? Um, I think I'm moving into a new sector. So um, when I started Applied Web Analytics, I sat in a room in an office in York and read that every book, every article, every blog post there was to read about Applied Web about web analytics and optimization and um, I don't know as much about supported living, about um, the kind of legal frameworks that these businesses operate in, um, but I'm finding out a, a lot more. So I think um, the process of immersing yourself in a in a in a, a knowledge base and meeting people as, as much as possible, I think. Uh, I realise the importance of networking and there's no better phrase, but it's not one I, it's about meeting people and because through conversation, something um, clicks or some opportunity opens itself up. And I think you've got to make every effort to to meet as many people as you can. Um, Pronto Homes is, 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 a, is something that I believe in because I, I think there's lots of buy to let Type property investors out there, but what I want is a business with purpose, and it, it certainly does. It's around providing property where some good things happen, which is yeah. people get support to live independent and full of fulfilling lives. Um, in the longer term, I want to improve my kite surfing. Um, I want to cycle from the top of South America to the bottom. Um, I want to live abroad some of the time. Um, right now, I'm um, going to be a volunteer in a special needs school um i'm applying to be a magistrate uh, in the family court and um things like uh i i uh, organize a monthly tea party through a charity called re-engage and we have about six older people from around york who get picked up and brought to tea party once a month and so that's on a on a very small scale um very fulfilling but i think if you aim to affect thousands of people's lives, you may not, but you can easily affect one person's life or two people's lives. So, and that that's much easier to achieve, and and the the results are very rewarding, and it's relatively easy to do to to get that. And one of the things that I think 
um, has come out of this uh, process of running a business is that sometimes when you when you're feeling down, um, the thing to do is go and help somebody else who's who's less fortunate, and that that sort of distracts you from your own set of ruminations. Um, and so I've I've always done some kind of volunteering. I've always found it found it helpful. Brilliant. Um, very, very sound advice. Really interesting that. I'll, uh, hmm. I'll take take that one board. Thank you. And I'm I'm keen to know what you would say to anyone that was thinking of going to business right now, Dad. I, I think it's um, a really exciting time. I think the tools that uh, people have at their uh, fingertips are very powerful and very cheap. Um, so I talked about Google Analytics becoming free in 2005. Yeah. Um, things like Shopify websites are really easy to, to use. And what it does is it forces you to think about the quality of the idea because the execution is made much more easy, made easier. Um, and so I've, I've been inspired by the writings of Alex Osterwalder, which is the business model canvas book. Um, there's other ones about defining a value proposition and testing business ideas. I like that whole process of developing a business, but testing each part of yeah. the of the proposition along the way. Because I've met lots of business owners who spent, and, and you can see this on Dragon's Den often, that spent hundreds of thousands of pounds developing an idea or a product, only to find that it's it's not a problem that anyone's really got and, and so so you know i think i think we have the mechanisms now um to test things much more uh robustly and to move away from a, a, a deploy and pray approach which is i've got this business idea i'm sure it's going to work um yeah. i need to find later on it, it doesn't so that's really exciting so if I was counselling anybody to start a business, I'd certainly do it, but see what you can do to um, answer the answer the core assumptions that you're making about your business, to test those core assumptions, because it may be that this idea isn't going to work. This time. Yeah. And, and you want to get that answer very quickly. If it's not going to work, get yes. that quickly and move on. No, it makes perfect sense. And and if you started again, is there anything you think you might have significantly done differently? Um, yes, I think I came from a direct mail background. Um, in the so I, I run a, a, a mail or two mail order businesses, and it was all about direct response. Um, and I don't think it really understood the importance of branding or awareness building. Um, so Johan right now with, with AWA is spending a lot of time just raising our profile. It's something I didn't do. Um, I think I concentrated more at the bottom of the funnel in terms of sales and yes. prospects and meetings and so on. Um, so I would spend more time uh, raising awareness of the business, um, accepting that most people don't need you. At, at that point in time, they don't need you. Um, but you've got to carry on um, developing uh, a, a market for that. The other thing I would do differently is is develop a product for a prospect. By that I mean, um, we we have a scorecard on our website which allows you to evaluate. Uh, this is AWA's website. Evaluate the healthiness of your CRO program. Right. I think that those kinds of questionnaires or surveys are quite useful in getting giving people their sense of how well they're doing. Um, of course, it's a lead generation mechanism. But I think if you can develop a product aimed at prospects, not customers, prospects, that, that can help with your lead generation yeah. mechanisms. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. And what what would be the best advice you could give an eighteen year old you if you could go back in time and do so, Dan? I would have done it far earlier. I mean, I started AWA Applied Web Analytics at the age of forty. I wish I'd done it at the age of eighteen. 
because just the you don't have mortgages to worry about and you just i mean rents much higher than it was but um you can afford to, to fail easily yes. uh, much more easily so i, I think i would have um I didn't know many business people at the age of 18. I was, um, I would have probably spent more time talking to them about their business. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think if you're interested in business, then my experience is that most business people would, would love to mentor somebody who's younger or, or yeah. talk to them about how they could start. Um, but you have to have an idea to start with. Uh, and you see a lot of people go into their family businesses or do something based on their first job, which is a perfectly good way of doing it. Um, yeah. yeah, start younger, um, do it, and then expect to to have to change it again. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So, very sound advice for anybody. Um, um, thanks so much for your time. It's been really fascinating, actually, and there's been lots of learnings there for me, and I'm Sure, for anyone else watching, if anyone would like for any reason to get in touch with you or the companies, what would be the best way to do so, Dan? Yeah, if you search for Pronto Homes, um, that would be or LinkedIn, um, Dan Crox and John at LinkedIn, you'll find me as well, and on Facebook as well, Pronto Homes on Facebook. Well, look, Dan, it'd be great to swing by in six, 12 months and just see the development of, especially Pronto Homes and your learning mm, through, mm. through growing that in a different, obviously a completely different industry. So uh, yeah, perhaps we can do sure. that. I'm happy to do that. And uh, thanks again so much for your time today. Happy to do that. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome.